Thank you. Um, okay, so thank you all for coming. Um, this is uh, the second invited special symposium at this year's SPSB. Um, and it's called Big Questions in Evolutionary Science and What They Mean for Social Personality Psychology. So in recent years, a number of scientists have been making major advances in our understanding of how evolutionary processes have shaped human social behavior. And they've done so using complex models of genetic evolution, cultural evolution, and gene culture co-evolution. I know that many of us social personality psychologists are well aware of these advances, use them in our own work, um, and use them to really to build on our own work and, and to help with the kind of research we do. Um, however, I also know that many people think that there's not a whole lot of need for evolutionary thinking in social psychology and that perhaps we need to be particularly cautious about bringing evolutionary models into social psychological research and personality research. So what Mickey and I wanted to do in organizing this special session is bring together three leaders in the field who can really help us all understand why evolutionary thinking can be so useful for social personality research and um, how it can really enhance our science and also what some of the controversies and hot issues in this developing uh, line of research are. So this is going to be a little bit different than some of the other symposia you all have seen this weekend. The way it's going to work is we're first going to hear uh, briefly for about 10 minutes from Jonathan Haidt, who of course is a leader in social psychology. And um, Jonathan's going to provide an overview of what uh, the big thinking or the latest thinking in evolutionary science is. But the reason that he in particular is talking is because I think he's a fantastic example of someone who's really incorporated evolutionary thinking into his own work on morality and moral decision making. Next, we're going to hear from Joe Henrik, who for the past several decades has been working with a small group of people to develop and really kind of found what's still a fair, fairly new understanding of cultural evolution and gene culture co-evolution. So Joe's going to talk for about 20 minutes and outline some of his ideas and, and sort of how these models work and, and why they're important for social psychology. Then we're going to turn to Lita Cosmides, who I think since at least the early 1990s has been one of the real leaders in evolutionary psychology and, and with a small handful of people is one of the few people responsible for bringing evolutionary psychology to the forefront of our field. Um, so we'll hear from Lita also for about 20 minutes explaining how her view of, of evolutionary psychology works and, how it's, and why it's important for social psychology as well. After that, um, John is going to kind of lead a discussion between Joe and Lita and hopefully we'll really home in on some of the areas of disagreement as well as the areas of agreement and convergence. And then we'll end by taking some questions from the audience and, and having kind of a general discussion. So that's a lot to get to. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Haidt from NYU. Uh, thanks, Jess. Um, all right, so, so this is my, my talk title is The Rabbi's Wife is Wrong. Um, I think this was in Fiddler on the Roof. It's an old Jewish folk tale about uh, two men who come to the rabbi to plead their case. They've got a disagreement with each other. The, uh, the first man pleads his case. The rabbi says, hmm, you're right. Second man pleads his case. The rabbi says, hmm, and you're right. Then the rabbi's wife says, but rabbi, they can't both be right. Hmm, and you're right. So, um, you know, but as we often see, the rabbi's wife is often wrong. Actually, often both sides really can be right. And we see this, or at least I see it, studying moral psychology. I see it more and more when you have smart, sincere people who disagree over a long period of time. Often they are both right in, in, in many, many interesting and important ways. Um, and so today we're blessed to have two of the most brilliant people in the social sciences uh, with us. Um, you know how there are some people, when you're talking with them, you just feel kind of like, like slow and like you're walking through molasses and they're like flying ahead on, on golden wings? Uh, that's, that's Joe and Lita. And, and I often feel kind of dumb when I talk to them because they're just, you know, they're like always so intensely thinking about the things that they think about. Like I, they dream about them, I hear from their, their partners. Um, <laughs> And they've both been part of, of uh, teams that have really revolutionized thinking about human nature, human origins, um, human evolution. Most social psychologists know a little bit about, about uh, Lita and, and John, uh, her husband, John Tooby. Um, uh, most people know a little bit about their approach to evolutionary psychology, maybe a little bit about cheater detection. But as Jess was saying, we rarely cite evolutionary psychology. We rarely cite those, that kind of thinking because we're kind of afraid, like somebody could criticize you. It's not really necessary. Do I have to get into evolution? I don't have to, so I won't. And I think this is a huge missed opportunity. 
Similarly, everybody here has surely heard of Joe, Joe Henrik, um, if only because of his blockbuster papers. Everybody's heard of the weird uh, people paper. Everybody grants that they're absolutely right, and then most of us do nothing whatsoever to change the way we work. But we've all heard of him, at least. Um, or the, the giant papers that the, these huge research projects he's led, leading teams in 15 or 20 different societies around the world, doing economic games. So everybody's heard of Joe, but I think very few people in psychology really know the core of his thinking. Uh, about gene culture coevolution, um, uh, about, about learning mechanisms, and about the origin of cooperation. And this also is a huge missed opportunity for social psychology. Um, so, in, um, so my view is that these are two people that everybody needs to know, uh, and they should be more widely cited, and ju they're just going to help us think better. So in the rest of my time now, I want to basically uh, testify for both of them. I'll just tell you a little bit about how how much they've helped me think about evolution. I'm not an expert in evolution. I think about morality all day long. But it's just been so helpful to draw from evolutionary thinking. And I feel as though it's, it's just helped me see things that I couldn't possibly have seen otherwise. So here's my story is uh, I arrived at Penn in 1987 for grad school, the same year Alan Fisk arrived. Um, and I actually went there to study cognitive psychology. And I ended up just switching over to morality and assembling a committee. And I was just so lucky. That, uh, that we had Alan Fisk, who was an anthropologist who really believed in, in uh, was trying to work evolutionary thinking into his anthropology, and Paul Rosen, a general psychologist who was a, uh, had done some important work in evolutionary thinking, but was uh, becoming more of a cultural psychologist as well. So there was a kind of a mood at Penn that even though you know, sociobiology was sort of a dirty word in the social sciences back in 1987, there was a kind of a mood that evolution and culture are both really, really important. How, how do we put them together? And so when the adapted mind came came out in 1992. This was a really big deal. Um, it was a big deal at Penn. It was a big deal at, at a lot of schools. Uh, because it was the most detailed statement ever about how to think about both evolution and culture uh, at the same time. Um, evolutionary psychology is simply psychology that is informed by the additional knowledge that evolutionary biology has to offer. Now, who could be against that? The other thing that was so thrilling about it was the vision that it offered. We often say in social psychology, we have no grand theory. We have a lot of mini theories. Um, but uh, Lita and John and, and um, Jerome Barkow wrote, uh, it unites modern evolutionary biology with the cognitive revolution in a way <clears throat> that has the potential to draw together all of the disparate branches of psychology into a single organized system of knowledge. Well, how exciting is that? So it was a really thrilling event, uh, and that work has progressed on, and again, I think it just hasn't had the influence on our field that, that it, it should have had. At the same time, at the same time as this group was working based out of Santa Barbara, um, just down the road in, in Los Angeles and other parts of California, another group was developing a different approach, beginning with uh, Rob Boyd and Pete Richardson's book on dual inheritance theory, culture and the evolutionary process. Uh, they developed their thinking into a, a really wonderful book, Not by Genes Alone, and while they were developing these ideas, Joe came to join them, um, and uh, uh, he met his wife Natalie there, and the two of them teamed up. What is it about evolutionary psychology? You have to be married to one? Is that the way it works? So, um, so he, uh, they wrote this incredible book, um, Why Humans Cooperate. Uh, this is a book that I've, I always assigned when I was at UVA, and I would teach any sort of grad seminar. I always assigned this book, because it is just an incredible book for thinking about how we, how we, why we cooperate, and um, for thinking about evolution and culture and behavior. It's a really good book for, I think every grad student in psychology and social psychology should read this book. Um, so while that focuses especially on cooperation, uh, most recently Joe has come out with his own, his own sort of grand theory, his, like, here's how you can think about, about everything. Uh, and this is a really wonderful book, just came out last fall. And in it, in the introduction, in the preface, Joe talks about his own sort, his own sort of origin uh, origin story, um, how he was, he was doing field work, he was learning uh, about uh, behavior in all these different cultures, and he uh, had this murky vision for what he wanted to do, to integrate insights from across the social and biological sciences, to build an evolutionary approach to studying human psychology and behavior that takes seriously the cultural nature of our species. And again, how exciting is that? So these visionaries thinking about how to unify knowledge, and evolution is essential for unifying knowledge about the human, about human behavior. Uh, and then, of course, Joe also was incredibly innovative about methods, coming as he was out of anthropology, and also actually out of economics, his experience in economics. 
Um, and so, uh, and he writes, from this vantage point, disciplines like anthropology and especially sub-disciplines like economic anthropology began to look small and insular. Now, he doesn't say it, but I think from that vantage point, social psychology, um, when divorced from evolution and culture, I think can look small and insular too. And so, again, they're both offering us ways to achieve consilience with the rest of the behavioral sciences and social sciences. Um, so I just want to say, so we have these two amazing books or approaches, and, and as we were going around by email before this session trying to figure out, well, what are the points of difference, um, what we found is that there are certainly different perspectives, and there's a lot in common. So both of them reject the idea of a blank slate. Uh, this was like the great dragon that Lita and John really slayed, um, although it's not entirely dead, but even though they killed it, it somehow doesn't die. Um, but the, you know, the standard social science model. Um, uh, both theories, both approaches have a very strong focus on learning. You can't understand learning unless you take an evolutionary view about why we humans are so different and why we learn in such different ways from other animals, so much social learning. Um, and third, they both use a great variety of methods, including lab studies and field studies. There are differences of emphasis, and just this is my personal list. Uh, I think the biggest differences are that when you, they, when you read Lita and John's work, you, you get the sense of like this incredible, you know, sculptor, evolution is like a sculptor. It's a design process, Lita says. It's a, you know, sculpting away and crafting this, these mechanisms. Um, and you see, you also see cultural differences, not necessarily as due to transmission vertically, but as the evocation of ancient mechanisms that, um, that can be activated by circumstances. Uh, and Joe would not disagree with either of those, just that there's a difference of emphasis. On Joe's side, when you read Joe, there's a lot less, there's no talk about sculpting or finely sculpting or that, that sort of stuff. Much more about learning. Um, and Joe is much more focused on uh, cultural evolution, how both culture and genetics are two strands that are changing in sync, uh, in sync and influencing each other. Um, so in my last few minutes, I just want to give a sense of some of the fantastic, um, just how these have been so helpful to me, some of the things that I've been able to look at in, in morality that I couldn't have otherwise. So from Lita, um, I really got the, the pluralist perspective on valuation. They have this fantastic chapter in the, the Stephen Stitch volume on the innate mind um, where they talk about how is it that any creature comes to value anything and they make it clear there can't be a gigantic valuation module that says, you know, good, bad, just about anything. It has to be content and context specific. Um, predators but not prey must be avoided. Offspring must be fed rather than eaten. Reliable as opposed to faithless cooperators preferred, etc. Our ancestors faced, and going back way before the, the, even the hominid line, uh, these recurrent challenges, and the race went to those that could best solve them. Um, valuation processes and valuation ontologies are rich because there are many mechanisms to orchestrate in preparation for action. So this general approach that there's multiple sources of value that we have to be attuned to led very directly to moral foundations theory. Uh, this is a slide I'll show uh, at five o'clock today in my uh, discussion, uh, discussion with, with Kurt Gray, um, that there's more than one valuation uh, module, you might say. And it was essential to take an evolutionary approach to, to make some sense of the variety of moral intuitions. Uh, second, um, Lita and John's work has really helped me to understand these strange things that happen um, that seem to come from out of nowhere. So I have a, a group of college friends that I get together with once a year. And one year, about 10 years ago, they, we all met in Charlottesville and we played paintball. None of us had ever done this before. It was, you know, a bunch of sort of, you know, nerdy, overeducated suburban guys, you know, mixed up with, with like, there was a survivalist, there were some local kids, and we were divided into two teams, and then we were supposed to hunt and kill each other. And, and it was absolutely thrilling. I mean, it was like nothing we had ever experienced. It, it, and we were all in awe afterwards. And, you know, sure, we'd seen war movies, but this didn't feel like we were acting out scripts we'd heard. This felt like there was a room in our brain that said, in case of war, open door, and you'll find it fully stocked. And we did. And it, I mean, it was, you know, it was weird. But when you take, when you take Lita's perspective, it makes sense. Um, uh, similarly, after 9-11, the same sorts of things. I, I had all sorts of feelings that I just couldn't explain. They seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, and last, uh, cooties. Cooties is actually, it's not in every culture, but you find it in a bunch of cultures. And it seems much more like the externalization of a contagion sensitivity module than it does like just something that kids happen to transmit. So in all those ways, 
um, I think Lita's approach just really helps. Um, uh, Joe has really, really helped me to understand morality in these ways. Once you see evolution or human evolution as in part a race to learn the best, whoever gets the best information wins. And so you're looking for the best role models. And if you can take shortcuts and find the best role models, well, you're ahead. And so this is the origin of prestige. And when I read this incredible paper with, uh, that he wrote with uh, Francisco Gil White, it was the Rosetta Stone for understanding so many things, especially awe. Why is it that we hold people in awe and when we have an awe experience, we then want to follow the person like a disciple? And you read this paper and it makes sense. Um, secondly, uh, uh, cultural group selection plus uh, gene culture uh, coevolution. You, you, you just play it out and you understand tribalism in all its forms and how we can get gigantic cooperative organisms that can, um, um, that can work together to kill brutally. Um, and lastly, Joe helps us see uh, that we have to look at institutions um, while we're thinking about human behavior. I'm very concerned about some changes happening uh, on college campuses in America. And you can't understand the new morality uh, on many colleges unless you understand the way universities have been changing, the media has been changing, social media has been changing. So Joe helps sort of pull us out of our sort of you know, individual mindset and think about adaptation within institutions that are co-evolving. So to conclude, um, I hope that you will look at the, these two presentations, these two approaches as two really powerful perspectives that, that can be integrated into basically everything we study. Uh, thank you. <laughs>